relationship. So I say, let us free up our imaginations and unlock not only God, but ourselves as well from constraining ideas and welcome God the bride and God the bridegroom into a relationship of friendship, mutuality, and love. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. We've got uh, some good amount of time now for questions. One of the courses that she teaches is constructive theology. And constructive theology, of course, doesn't just come from the top down. So I would invite uh, each of you, if you uh, address a question to Susan, if you would identify yourself and out of what construct you're doing your theology, whether it be the Tower of Power in the Rossi Wing or <laughs> the uh, <coughs> Religion Department at Mercy High School or any other place like that. Um, I'm Marty Foss, and I'm in the basement of a basement, I suppose, down in uh, the history department. Um, I thought your talk was very, very interesting and filled with great insight. It seemed to me there was one, there's one theology, at least, in terms of reconstructing power, reconfiguring power in the church, um, and that would be conciliarism, um, where, at least the way it was formulated by some thinkers in the 14th and 15th century, you know, said, the church is the people of God. The Pope is not the church. The hierarchy is not the church. The priests are not the church. Um, of course, Martin V deemed it ex probabilis, and he was quickly canonized thereafter. But if, if there would be some way of implementing that kind of leadership theology, would there be room for many of the ideas you have? And you know, I think, I don't know, but much of what you said, I mean, that clearly women are suffering under a greater burden than men, but. Um, it really is, the, I think, in some ways, the problem of a, of a clerical organization against the laity, where we're yeah. marginalized. Well, you're quite right about that. And um, actually, in, in some other stuff I've written, I've suggested that, that what we really have is a feminized laity kind of official uh -huh. church. Um, that, that there's a reason why the bride is talked about, the church is talked about as she. You know, it's not just, just accidental. Um, you know, I'm certainly not the only, it's certainly far from being the first one to say this, but I think a number of people have commented that the unfulfilled promise of Vatican II is really the ecclesiology. Uh, and certainly even the Holy Father himself has, has opened the door to suggesting what are some ways in which we can sort of decentralize that. And yet, we, we don't see much happening at all. Here again, though, I don't think this is I, I think, like one of the people that I um, worked on in my dissertation, my, my thinking is influenced by Edward Skilovic, a Flemish theologian, who his suggestion is that these these things happen from the ground up. So I don't think we're going to all of a sudden be waiting for the father and the pastor to read a letter saying, "Okay, folks, we've just heard this from Rome, and we want you to know we're divvying things up a little bit." But you see, I think in some ways it's already happening, and. You know, as I was saying to, to Jim's group of students there this morning, um, I was sort of saying a little bit of what you're saying, that the church for me is not the superstructure of hierarchy. It's, they're part of it, but it's, it's the people. And that what, what's going on in a lot of parishes, what's going on, um, I don't know to what extent it's happening out here, but the number of churches where women are in fact the pastors, um, and you know the joke that people will talk about saying, well, you know, a father so-and-so came, comes in here once a month and his mass is okay, but, you know, a sister's mass is really so much better. <laughs> you know, and, and it's not math, but of course, in terms of the experience of the people, when sister or whomever gets up there and reads the scriptures and preaches and distributes communion as far as the people are concerned, yeah, it's maybe a little shorter than a mass, but it's not much different. So it seems to me that um, that a lot of this is is happening in some grassroots ways, and I, I think that that things are going to happen from the ground up, and that you know if you if you take the long view of history, which I think if you're a Catholic you have to, um, Vatican II was 40 years ago, which um, 
I mean, and, I, and I'm not suggesting here, please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, okay, everyone, let's be patient, you know, change comes gradually, and, and I, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying that in some ways, um, there is an unfulfilled promise from Vatican II, and that we have to remember that, and we have to, I think, keep, keep struggling to, um, to get that vision of the church as the people of God much more a reality, and I, um, what can I say, that's, that's how I think about it. Do I see a whole lot of positive movements in that direction? No, I don't, um, but uh, it doesn't mean for me that unless I see uh, affirmation from the top down, that I'm, and that's not where I'm looking for, for the positive sources. Can I just ask a brief? Sure. Um, what, what, what made conciliarism work, I think, was that bishops endorsed it, and cardinals endorsed it, and the leaders of the church endorsed it. And with the current administration's death grip on the episcopacy, at least in America, I mean, is there any hope for a kind of change there? You know, if you ask somebody in 1957 what they thought the church would look like in 10 years, <laughs> so. Honestly, I, I, I think that probably a number of bishops are, would think positively in that direction, but you don't find a lot of independent thinking, in my experience, from the U.S. bishops. Uh, I think they're, to be honest, I think there's fear on the part of bishops. And that, you know, in any kind of culture, fear doesn't lead to creativity. It leads to the consequences. Um, Steve Prevet. My question comes from. Oh, you're the president. I am the president. <laughs> <laughs> Power and tower, whatever. Uh, whenever I do weddings and we use the, the reading from Genesis, I'm yeah. struck, you know, in God's own image, God created the male and female, God created. Them. So whether this is true or not, that, that, what that says to me is that the image of God is not the individual person, mm -hmm. but people in community, as God mm -hmm. is communitarian. Right. And I wonder if, if that, A, if that's true, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what the text says, or that's what I say, if people like the message. So, you know, you, you wonder what that would say to us about issues of sexuality, pride, right rooms. It, it's not individuals, but it's people in relationship. And it's only in relationship that God is appropriately imaged, because God is an entity in relationship. Oh, with, uh, oh yeah. And, and, you know, to do justice to the Vatican, this is precisely what they would say. But their understanding is that relationship is in a particular kind of relationship of this. Um, bride and bridegroom because of this understanding of sexuality being the essential quality of the human being. Because we had this question in class this morning, you know, well, if, if you have to have a natural resemblance, you know, to, to Jesus to be ordained, you know, what if you're not a Palestinian Jew? And, and you know, of course, the, the church is teaching that, that racial and ethnic differences are seen to be accidental, and sexuality is understood to be um, much more essential. Uh, you know, that's where there's a, a kind of an interesting uh, congruence, I think, of some feminist ideas with some papal ideas in the importance of relationality, in, in looking at how um, models of, of uh, ethics, for example, um, moving from, a, say, a less principle-based understanding to a more relational-based understanding. The problem is when you look at what constitutes that relationship, and I think that, at least in my sense, that there's a, a fairly, um, there's a fairly, well, I would say rigid, there's an understanding of what it means to be male and female that does not really account for the varieties of masculinity and femininity that we see, but also, you know, doesn't even account for the fact that um, we're not so neatly divided into boys and girls, and that, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, you're, you know, it's a kind of a, there's a polarity that's suggested here. And while I certainly do think that that message is one of relationality, that, that kind of relationality, I think, ought to be an openness to relationship and a creativity in relationships, rather than suggesting that these relationships are to be structured in this particular way.